Welcome to Foresight Space Group. I'm so excited to have Priyan uh, Levin with me and Avi Loeb, who we've been trying to coordinate with for such a long time now. We're a big fan of your work at Foresight, and I will say no more because Priyan, uh, we're introduce you. Yeah, just briefly, everybody presumably knows Avi, but just for the record, he's one of the most interesting, innovative, expansive uh, astrophysicists alive, you know, with hundreds of publications and all kinds of speeches and committees and projects and investigations over the years. I want to just briefly say one thing that Avi may not even remember, which is how I first encountered him and, and the effect it had on me. And I presume that this is the effect he's had on thousands of students, a very similar effect, because Avi's one of these great professors. I can just tell. I wish I'd taken class from him. Uh, this was, Avi, this was like very early on in the history of the Breakthrough Foundation talks, those Breakthrough Discuss meetings. And I think this may have been the first or second one, so 12 years ago or something like this, that you were invited to give a talk. But I had a nice discussion with you after your wonderful talk. You were kind enough to give me some of your time. And you told me something that was really, that really filled my heart with inspiration to this day, which is you talked about how a sane science policy nationally or for a foundation should have a portfolio. And I think you actually said, and just like an investment portfolio, you have some in bonds and some in blue chips and some in smaller equities and some in junk bonds. You know, you trade off risk versus return and you want to have a broad portfolio. Similarly in science, you do most of your investment in kind of straight science and traditional science, but you want to save some of the investment funds you have for things that are higher risk so that you have some high risk potential, high payoff projects in your portfolio. And so this has, was something I've been thinking about. And now, as some of you may know, I'm working on a project in just this area, but that's not about me. Avi, I don't know exactly what you're going to talk about. You're going to give the talk 45 minutes or so. I'll prime the Q and A with some questions, uh, and then we'll hand it over to audience questions and wrap it up in about an hour. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind introduction. As it turns out, I was in Washington, D.C. yesterday, and I will just summarize very briefly what happened on Capitol Hill before describing the science that I'm doing, because it's very much related. But just in, in the context of what Creon was just saying, I'm often asked by fledgling uh, scientists what my advice to them would be, and they see that I innovated this phase of my career. But I tell them uh, the story about uh, Pablo Picasso that uh, in initially started painting realistically. And when he was asked uh, why did he start in a realistic painting style, he said that first he wanted to master the technique that was used by his predecessors. And that's my advice to young people. Don't start by innovating outside the box. First, you need to master the craft that uh, the way it was uh, handled before you. And once you demonstrate that you are capable of doing what everyone else is doing, then um, you, you, you are qualified to venture into innovative techniques. And in the case of Picasso, it was abstract painting, the cubism that he pioneered. Um, but coming back to where I was, in fact, I just finished my commitment in DC at midnight and arrived to where you see me now about an hour ago. And I managed, I didn't sleep much because I wanted to write up my experience there. And usually I put an essay on medium.com. So you can actually follow me uh, for free. It's a free subscription. And this is the one I put uh, at 1 a.m. last um, today. Um, and um, I just wanted to read to you the paragraph that uh, summarizes what I said at the beginning of my presentation. It was in Capitol Hill. There were 75 people from government, uh, the commercial sector, and just people who are excited about the research I'm doing. And I, I signed books for them. But at the opening, what I said is the following. I said, thank you all for coming here to discuss the most romantic question in science. Let me make it a little bigger. Do we have an intelligent cosmic partner? That's the most romantic question in science. My plea to the US government officials in the audience is simple. 
If you know of information that provides an answer to this question, please let me know right away. This would save me plenty of time on blind dates as I search the sky and oceans for evidence. Your day job is national security. My day job is what lies outside the solar system. If any of us sees something that the other is looking for, let's talk about it. It is not good practice to hide scientific knowledge. If we believe today that Mars orbits the Earth, as the Church suggested before Nicolaus Copernicus, one of its priests, then our rockets would never have reached Mars. From afar, rockets flying out of Earth by technological design is a sign of our intelligence. In reciprocity, if we discover extraterrestrial rockets, they would be a sign of extraterrestrial intelligence. In other words, if we find a tennis ball in our backyard, we would know that our neighbor plays tennis. And let me just mention the last sentence in my essay. Science is better than politics. And I felt a great uh, satisfaction saying that just before midnight last night in Washington, D.C. And I hope that most people on this call agree with me that science is better than politics in several ways. One, that it relies on evidence. There is an, a, an arbitrator, which is the data. So it's not a matter of opinion. And uh, moreover, um, it, uh, it is an infinite sum game. Politics is often a zero sum game. In science, if you gain new knowledge, everyone benefits. Nobody loses. So it's an infinite sum game, very different, very big difference relative to politics. Okay, so let me now get to my presentation and I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. So first, let me mention a dream that I have and uh, it's not in the spirit of Martin Luther King, it's not limited to the earth. My dream is to go to the only other object within the solar system that has liquids on its surface, in addition to Earth having liquid water in its lakes, oceans, rivers, and that's Titan, a moon of Saturn. It has a temperature which is a third of the temperature on the surface of Earth relative to the absolute zero. It's about 90 degrees Kelvin. And the liquid on the surface Sorry, of Titan. Are we are still seeing your the medium post. Is that correct, or are you trying to? No. Show the um, sorry. Um, Just a few. Something is not working then because I'm showing my first slide, so you're not. If seeing... you unshare, if you unshare the medium post, or if you unshare everything for a second, and then Wait. we share and then click the slides. Okay, let me it stop share and um, do it again. Do you see it now? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So this is an image of Titan, moon of Saturn, and the liquid on the surface is methane and ethane. And my dream is to go fishing on Titan. Now, obviously, if you go there and look for fish, if you find fish, it's life as we don't know it, because it's in a different liquid. It's not water. And I would never eat such fish because it could be hazardous to my health. But it would be very significant discovery because the temperature in the universe was 90 degrees Kelvin above absolute zero after the first stars formed. And that means that anywhere in the universe, if there was an object like Titan, it could have been warmed by the cosmic microwave background. It doesn't need to be close to a star like the sun. And then NASA in 2028, in about four years, will have a mission to Titan called Dragonfly. So maybe we will know more about life on Titan within four years. Oops. Sorry. By the way, we have one of the creators of the progenitor of that mission on this call, which is... Oh, excellent. Excellent. So I'm giving free advertisement. So when I go out uh, to the and look at the sky at night, I see all these stars and they're part of the Milky Way galaxy, which is moving through intergalactic space. And it looks like a giant spaceship 
with all these lights being the lights from cabins on that spaceship. And I often wonder if there are other passengers in those cabins. I think it's arrogant of us to believe otherwise. But one approach to address this question is indeed to check if Obviously, there is. Did you, yes. did, you, did you mean to stop sharing your screen? Oh, you did it stop again? Are you not seeing the, the night sky? No, okay. no, we're seeing you. If you uh, reshare. Okay, let me do it again. I'm not sure why it's happening. Oh, so it was somehow stopped. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Okay. And so one way to find out whether there are other passengers is to look for objects that uh, may have been produced by other intelligent civilizations. Of course, the other approach is to search for microbes. And many of my colleagues are very fond of microbes because if we find them, it doesn't threaten our ego. We still feel superior. We go to restaurants and on the menu, you would find the uh, uh, animals that we regard as less intelligent than we are. And uh, we are, we give ourselves the, the green light to eat them. Of course, that means that if we ever encounter extraterrestrial intelligence, we need to leave a good impression because otherwise they would put us on their menu. But the traditional approach was to look for radio signals, which is not really necessarily effective because nobody may call you when you are waiting for a phone call. Nobody may recognize that you are lonely. They might be hooked to their digital screens. They don't care about our loneliness. Why would they broadcast exactly the time that we are looking for those signals? And another approach is to search for objects in our backyard. And the first such object that was uh, reported uh, from a telescope in Hawaii, PanStars, is Oumuamua in 2017. And I was surprised that uh, this object was discovered the size of a football field, simply because a decade earlier, I wrote a paper, published a paper that forecasted that there shouldn't be rocks of this size in a large enough number for PanStars, the survey telescope, to find any of them during its, the decade of its operation. And uh, nevertheless, here it was. So when you are wrong in making a, a prediction, uh, that's nature's way of telling you that you might learn something new. So I was intrigued uh, because science is a learning experience. It's all about learning things that you haven't expected. And it's driven by curiosity. I hate to pretend to be the adult in the room that knows the answer in advance. I would much rather let nature tell us the story. And so in this case, the, the amount of sunlight reflected from the object changed by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling every eight hours. And then that meant that the object has a very extreme shape. The best fit to the variation of light was that of a flat object, not the way it was depicted in this artistic conception. We didn't have an image of the object. And then it looked like the object is pushed away from the sun by some mysterious force without any evaporation, no cometary tail. And the question was, what is pushing it if it's not the rocket effect? And I suggested maybe it's the reflection of sunlight. And for that, the object had to be very thin. For example, imagine a broken piece of a Dyson sphere or a surface layer from a spacecraft that was torn apart after a billion years. It would be thin enough. And actually, three years later, there was another object discovered by the same telescope in Hawaii, pushed away from the sun by reflecting sunlight, no cometary tail. And within three weeks, it was realized that's actually a rocket booster from 1966 that NASA launched. And it had thin walls, and that's why it was pushed by reflecting sunlight. So here you have it, an example of a technological object that we know about because we produced it. Question is, who produced Oumuamua? And it was given this name, Oumuamua, because it means a scout in the Hawaiian language. And by the way, why would the first object that we discover from interstellar space be so weird? The question is, what was it? And of course, we can find more. The problem is this object is not observable anymore. It's a hundred million times fainter than it was close to Earth. We can't see it. We can't chase it. It's moving too fast. By the way, interstellar objects that come from outside the solar system 
uh, can be flagged by their velocity relative to the sun. If it's above the escape speed, we know that it's not bound by gravity to the sun. So Enrico Fermi asked, where is everybody? And uh, you know, that's very pretentious. That's a question that any single person asks. And what you tell the single person is, you know, you are not that attractive that by standing still, everyone will come to you. You really need to leave your home and go to dating sites, or at the very least, look through your window, the windows of your home. This is, I, I find this quite surprising that an experimental physicist like Enrico Fermi, who was also a theorist, would pose a question, maybe he didn't intend it, but not really follow up on it with, an experimental program. He didn't build any telescope. He didn't search. And by the way, nowadays, uh, just uh, last month, Elon Musk was saying, you know, where are the aliens? None of the 6,000 Starlink uh, communication satellites collided with uh, a UFO. And therefore, I haven't seen any evidence. After he said that, I checked the numbers. If you consider an object the size of a person, it would collide with one of these Starlink satellites in a thousand years. If you put it at the right altitude of uh, 550 kilometers, but it could be somewhere else. And um, this is not an efficient way uh, to find objects of interest by colliding with them. Um, so um, the point is, in order to find somebody, you really need to put an effort because space is vast. In the Milky Way galaxy, it's measured in units of tens of thousands of light years in the universe, in units of billions of light years. And time is very long. You know, most stars formed billions of years before the sun. And then there was enough time for an object like Voyager to move from one side of the Milky Way to the other. In fact, we just did the calculation with an undergraduate student, and we're writing a paper about it at Harvard to calculate what will happen to Voyager in a billion years. It will be on the opposite side from the relative to the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So there was plenty of time for space trash to reach our backyard from other civilizations. And actually, just a few months ago, I was invited to Torun, Poland, the birthplace of Nicolaus Copernicus, the governor of the region, gave me a, a leather-bounded copy of uh, their revolution bus. You can see it behind me. Uh, I was asked to give a keynote lecture celebrating the 550th anniversary of his birthday. And uh, I titled the, the talk, The Next Copernican Revolution. Obviously meaning that not only that we are not at the physical center of the universe, we're also not at the intellectual center of the universe. And, you know, we tend to think that everything is about us. I can understand it because both my daughters, when they were young, they thought that the world centers on them because everyone was focusing on them at home. But when they left on the first day to the kindergarten, they had a psychological shock. They found others that are very similar to them. So it's a very natural tendency for us to be self-centered. At first, we would argue we are at the physical center. Then we realize we are not. And by the way, this realization came because Nicolaus Copernicus was a priest. He didn't want to rock the boat. He just wanted to help the church. And the church had a problem. They couldn't figure out when Easter takes place within a few days. And so he realized they might be using the wrong model. They have the earth at, at the center of the solar system. And if you put the sun in the center, then you can predict Easter better. So he gave the model to the church and they said, thank you very much. We will use the model, but we all know that in reality, the earth is at the center of the world. And they banned his book. It was a forbidden book until the 19th century. And he saw the, public, the published version of his book on his deathbed. And all of that because he didn't want to rock the boat. But my point is, if the boat heads in the wrong direction, you need to rock it. That's what Galileo Galilei did, and he was put in house arrest. Today, he would have been cancelled on social media. And so what you see here is an image of Elon Musk's Tesla Roadster car. It's a real image. You can see the Earth behind it. It was launched as a dummy payload 
on the 2018 uh, test uh, launch of the Falcon Heavy. And it's now on an elliptic orbit around the sun. Within 20 million years, it might collide with Earth. And if my colleagues, academic astronomers, were uh, not aware of, of it approaching Earth, simply because it's too small, it's not the size of a football field, you can't see enough uh, sunlight reflected from it to detect it. Uh, when they see it as a meteor appearing in the, uh, burning up in the Earth's atmosphere, they would say it's a rock of a type that we've never seen before. But it is a rock. And how dare you consider anything else? Now, people often say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So first, I wanted to mention that I don't think Elon Musk is the most accomplished space entrepreneur since the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. I think it would be arrogant to argue that because there are hundreds of billions of stars like the sun uh, having a planet the size of the Earth, roughly at the same separation in the Milky Way galaxy alone. So the argument is extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. First of all, I think they require just evidence. And second, extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. In, we had to invest 10 billion dollars in the Large Hadron Collider at CERN to smash particles at high enough energy before we discovered the Higgs boson. We couldn't just argue the Starlink satellites never detected evidence for the Higgs boson, therefore it might not exist. That's not the way to do science. You have to design instruments that are especially targeting what you're looking for. And it takes a lot of effort. My point is that new scientific knowledge does not fall into our lap. It's a lot of work. By chance, we found interstellar objects like Oumuamua that I mentioned over the past decade. Before that, we didn't have a survey telescope like PANSTARS because PANSTARS resulted from a decision by the US Congress to find 90% of the objects bigger than a football field that may come very close to Earth because we know that the dinosaurs were killed by an object the size of Manhattan Island, 10 kilometers or so, 66 million years ago. And we are smarter than the dinosaurs. We can trace a, a big object as it comes close to Earth. So that was the purpose of uh, PANSTARS. And now there will be another telescope that will do a better job, the Rubin Observatory. And in the process of surveying the sky, PANSTARS found this interstellar object. That's the way science happens. Uh, things you don't expect in advance happen. And you can't really forecast discoveries. So it turns out that actually after Oumuamua was discovered, I asked my student, um, Amir Siraj, to look through the catalog of NASA of meteors. And I said, maybe there is a meteor cataloged by the US government that was moving relative to the sun faster than the escape speed from the solar system. And maybe we can discover more objects like Oumuamua, except those are meteors, that objects that collide with Earth. And you can see even an object you know, the size of a watermelon because it generates a fireball that carries a few percent of the Hiroshima atomic bomb energy. And in fact, on January 8, 2014, there was such a meteor identified by sensors on U.S. government satellites. We called it the first recognized interstellar meteor. It was almost four years before Oumuamua. And its size was roughly half a meter, based on the amount of energy released. And then there was a third object. It looked like a comet, discovered by an amateur astronomer, Gennady Borisov, uh, in August 2019. And so I was asked, this one looks like a comet. It looks like a natural object. Why wouldn't you consider the other two natural, given that the third one was natural? And I said, if I walk down the street and I see a weird person, and after that I see a normal person, that doesn't make the weird person normal. And then around the same time that Oumuamua was discovered, there were reports submitted to the US Congress by the Director of National Intelligence. And uh, she was, uh, Avril Haynes was 
talking about the hundreds of objects that military personnel report about that cannot be identified. They were given the name unidentified anomalous phenomena. And as a result of the first report, a new office was established in the Pentagon. In fact, yesterday I met the first director of that office and other, another member of that office now. It's called the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office. Uh, and it looked at past reports and uh, realized that 97% of them uh, are probably explainable as drones, balloons, things that we are familiar with, human-made. And then there are a few percent that are not fully understood. You know, the task of government is national security. And of course, if you identify 97 or 98% of all anomalous objects, you, you can feel happy that you earned your salary. But then... Um, from the point of view of a scientist like myself, even if one in a billion objects, we know that there is a lot of crap in the sky. There, there are balloons, there are drones, airplanes. But even if one in a billion came from outside of this earth, that would be a major discovery that will change the future of humanity. So I think the role of God, we shouldn't expect government to tell us what lies outside the solar system. If they happen to find evidence, I would be delighted to know about it. I was hoping that yesterday someone would take me to the corner of their uh, room and uh, say, uh, Avi, what you're looking for uh, is already in possession of the U.S. government. Please uh, sign this NDA and we would like you to figure out what it means. Nobody came to me. So I don't know if the government has something or not. I haven't seen it. And as a scientist, I don't rely on hearsay. I rely on evidence. And by the way, this is not just my approach. It's also the approach of FIFA, the World Soccer Organization. A year ago, there was the Women's World Cup. And when there was controversy about the goal, they didn't go around. The referees did not go and ask the players or ask the audience. Eyewitness testimonies are not reliable. Humans are not credible detectors. Instead, the FIFA used cameras to figure out whether there was a goal or not. That's the scientific method. After the Avril Haynes delivered her first report, I decided to lead the Galileo project. And we built an observatory that is already functioning at Harvard University, looking at the sky 24-7 in the infrared, optical, radio, and audio. And by now, it was operating for six months. We looked at about half a million objects. None of them was anomalous. We are writing a paper that put limits on the occurrence rate of anomalous objects. Near, It may be a situation very similar to real estate. There are three factors in real estate location. And the same may be true about these unidentified objects. So we are building a copy of this uh, observatory in Colorado uh, right now. And there is a third copy uh, that was just funded by the Richard King Mellon Foundation at $600,000 to be built in Pennsylvania. So within a year, we'll have three observatories looking at the sky in three locations, and we might move them around. And uh, the goal is to have data on tens of millions of objects that will be analyzed by machine learning software. And we would try to figure out if there is anything extraterrestrial among those. But the most exciting uh, results came from an expedition that I decided to lead to find materials from the first interstellar meteor that I mentioned. It exploded over the Pacific Ocean. And when I wrote the paper with my student, undergraduate student at the time, Amir Siraj, it was the referees blocked the paper. They said, we don't believe the U.S. government. So I was at the time I chaired the board on physics and astronomy of the National Academies. And I was frustrated by that. I mentioned it at dinner that we had in Washington. And through the White House, I was able to reach uh, the U.S. Space Command. And they wrote this letter that you see on the left, confirming that indeed this object was interstellar in origin based on its velocity measurement. They went back to the data and confirmed it at the 99.999% confidence. And you might think, 
yeah, at that point, astrophysicists should accept that uh, data. Our paper got accepted for publication, but a year later, there was another paper accepted for publication in the Astrophysical Journal saying, you know, we don't trust the U.S. government because we, when we try to fit this data with a stony meteorite, a meteor made of stone that we are familiar with in the solar system, we just cannot fit it. And therefore, the velocity must have been two times smaller. And I was thinking to myself, what kind of an arrogant statement is that? The U.S. Space Command is funded at $30 billion, supposed to advise the President of the United States about ballistic missiles heading towards Washington, D.C. from North Korea. If they got measurements wrong by a factor of two, they would alert Mexico for the same ballistic missiles. And to just say that because a model does not feed data, the data must be wrong, it's the most arrogant statement that a theorist can make. So at that point, when we got the confirmation and the paper was accepted, I decided to lead an expedition to the Pacific Ocean. I announced it, and within a couple of months, I had a Zoom call, and the, the funder, Charles Hoskinson, said, you have the money. Now, the government also released the data on the light curve of this meteor and others in the CNEOS catalog. And you can see here, uh, this particular meteor from 2014 had three flares separated by a tenth of a second. And uh, they occurred in the low atmosphere of the Earth. We translated that into RAM pressure, the, pres the stress that the atmosphere exerted on the object, which was four times bigger than even the toughest meteorites that we are familiar with, iron meteorites from the solar system, can sustain. So not only this object was moving very fast, in fact, faster than 95% of the stars near the sun, it was also tougher than iron meteorites. And so that convinced me that we need to, do, to, to look for the materials, to explore where it came from, because it could be a Voyager-like meteor or a Tesla Roadster kind meteor. Imagine the engine of te the Tesla Roadster. You know, it wouldn't behave like an iron meteorite. So here is the expedition team, about 30 people on the deck of the ship Silver Star. And um, we used the magnetic sled, a sled connected to the ship through the wires that you see behind the team. And we would put the, the sled on the ocean floor at a depth of about a mile. And actually, the cable was about three miles long because the sled would be far behind the ship. And we would go back and forth across the error box of the Department of Defense for the explosion site. So what in the pictures at the top uh, um, are images of how the sled was brought from the ocean floor to the deck. And at the left corner, you see me jogging at sunrise the way I do every day. I did it today, I did it yesterday. Every day I jog about three miles at sunrise. And I did it also on the ship. The only surprise I had was that the, my workout app that I have on my watch showed that I'm actually running slower. So I thought maybe it's the jet lag, but then I realized that it's actually measuring the speed of the ship. And that's a, the GPS system is not measuring my speed because I'm running on the surface of a slow ship. At any event, there was a Netflix filming crew, which whom I saw yesterday as well in Washington. They're making a documentary about this research and it should come out by the end of 2025. And so they were filming me at uh, jogging at sunrise one morning and the director was saying faster and could you run three times more than usual? And it ended up being a jog of an hour and a half or about 10 miles. But at the end of it, the director said, it looks like you're running. Are you running away from something or towards something? And I said, both. I'm running away from some of my colleagues who have strong opinions, but are not seeking the evidence. And I'm running towards a higher intelligence in interstellar space. And so here you see the sled with the magnets on it, and we would scrape the magnets for any magnetic particles. In fact, we use the vacuum cleaner, as you can see at the bottom here, 
the image. And then we would bring the material under a microscope after drying it up, and most of it was volcanic ash. But then after the sixth day, we found something else. And these are, this is an example of a spheroid, a molten droplet from potentially a meteor explosion, very distinct from the background sand, less than a millimeter in size. And I reported about those findings in my diary reports on medium.com. There were millions of people around the world that read them. They were translated to Spanish. And my daughter saw some of these images. She said, uh, could I have one of those spherules uh, threaded uh, uh, on a necklace? And I said, no, it's uh, impossible to thread them. They're made of uh, very tough material and uh, they're less than a millimeter in size. And even in this image, you can see a few of them in various locations. We found 55 on the ship. And then I shipped all the materials to my home in the case that you see here on the right side using FedEx. It arrived and I brought it to the laboratory of my colleague at Harvard, the, a world-renowned geochemist named Stein Jacobson. You see him on one side of me. By the way, both of these people are much taller than I am. The second person is Sophie Bergstrom. She was a summer intern last year in after we came back from the expedition. And she wanted to become a science journalist. And at some point, she said that she would be happy to help with the science. And I gave her tweezers and a microscope. And she found 600 additional spherules. So with her help, we uh, all together had 850 spherules found. And uh, I gave her the honorary title, the Spheral Hunter. And in fact, she changed her ambition. Now she wants to become a scientist. And she is a summer intern at Harvard with me now once again this year. So I'm very glad that I changed. I turned a science journalist into a scientist. And what most of the spherules, these molten droplets, ended up being similar to solar system spherules. And we call them primitive with a composition not very far from the solar system materials, the materials that made the solar system, that the sun is made of. But we found that 10% of the spherules, about 80 of them from the meteor site, had a very different chemical composition. You see them on the right side. They are differentiated in the sense that some elements are very enhanced in them relative to solar system composition. So what you see here on the horizontal axis is elements from the periodic table, uh, as a function of their volatility. So elements on the right side are can be easily lost during an explosion. And indeed, we found that those special spherules are missing those volatile elements, uh, indicating that they resulted from a meteor explosion. And when we look at elements that are not volatile, we find that some of them have abundances relative to the standard solar composition. That's the normalization of the vertical axis, which uh, indicates one as the standard solar composition, CI chondrites. Uh, relative to that, some elements are up to a thousand times more abundant. These are elements like beryllium, lanthanum, uranium. So we had to invent a name. Such a composition was never reported in the scientific literature, so we called them Belau spherules for beryllium, lanthanum, uranium. And I'm not saying that it's necessarily an indication that this is an artificial object, because it could be, in fact, most likely is uh, a natural object, a rock, uh, that came from another planetary system where the conditions are very different in the solar system. And I published a paper uh, just this month that shows that if you consider a planet like the Earth, and bring it close to a dwarf star, the most common type of star that has 10% of the mass of the sun, it will get spaghettified by the tidal force. Uh, the planet will get ripped apart and you will end up with a stream of rocks, half of which will be ejected to interstellar space. And the amazing thing is that the speed by which the ejection will be is very similar to that of the first interstellar 
meteor, about 60 kilometers per second. And you can get the unusual composition because the rock on the surface of this planet will get melted by being exposed uh, to the dwarf star very close to it. Now, I obviously, my daughter says that, you know, just like uh, any singer that gets uh, well known, that they usually have uh, haters. And so as soon as uh, the public got extremely interested in this research, I obviously had critics within academia. That's driven by jealousy most of the time. But anyway, they try to find the best arguments to bring down this. Uh... And by the way, I should say it took us a year to plan the expedition. Two weeks in the ocean without much sleep. We had to work around the clock. And many of the runs that we had, we had 26 runs. Uh, they were in the middle of the night. And as the chief scientist, I had to wake up and make sure that we collect everything and put it in files. And it was a lot of work. And then after that, it was nine months of very detailed analysis. And so the people who criticize, they don't have access to the materials. They are just trying to find reasons to uh, raise dust and claim that they don't see anything. So at first they said the U.S. government must be wrong in the measurement. Then they said this might be fly ash. What you find found might be human-made on Earth. And so we checked 55 elements from the periodic table and showed that it's not coal ash. The abundances of some elements are very different by a factor of 10 to 100 than coal ash. And so then, just a few months ago, there was another storm of criticism. Uh, some people said the meteor was a truck. Now, first of all, that sounds like nonsense. And it is nonsense because a truck cannot produce a few percent of the Hiroshima atomic bomb energy. And that's how the sensors on U.S. government satellites detected this meteor. That's the error box that we relied on and went to do 26 back and forth surveys of that error box. But there was additional data, for example, from a seismometer in Manus Island. That was just supplementary data. So the claim of those scientists was the signal that was they reported around the time of the meteor uh, in a seismometer on Manus Island could have been a truck. And then the New York Times reports about the meteor being a truck. I just couldn't believe it. I said, if you report about science with, while ignoring facts, how can I believe anything you say about politics? And we're talking about science journalism. So the meteor was not a truck because we used the <laughs> Department of Defense Aerobox relying on the flash of light emitted by this meteor. But we could not conclude the origin of the meteor because the spherules that we identified lost volatile elements. So we don't know the full composition. They were molten, so we don't know the physical properties of the material. We need to find a bigger pieces of the original ob object. Um, and so we are planning the next expedition. And what you see here is the last uh, evening of the expedition uh, uh, after celebrating with champagne uh, the discovery of the spherules. Uh, we looked at the sunset with uh, uh, the navigator on this uh, expedition, uh, who is on my left here, Art Wright. He's 87 years old. Uh, he was a commander on a destroyer during the Vietnam War. And he didn't say much. Uh, but any, everything he said was true. And that's why I really enjoy speaking with him. He reminded me of my father. And we were looking at the sunset and thinking and planning the next expedition, which we hope to do in the coming year. Uh, the goal would be to find bigger pieces. And for that, we need to use a robot to put a, a, a remotely operated vehicle on the ocean floor, about a mile deep, and have a video feed that allows us to decide what to pick up. And therefore, this mission would be more expensive. Uh, it will be six and a half million dollars in cost. And as of now, we are looking for a potential funder. If anyone listening to this is interested in being on the ship, let me know. Another piece of news that is quite encouraging, next year in 2025, there will be 
a better survey telescope looking at the sky than pan stars in Hawaii. It's called the Rubin Observatory, funded by the National Science Foundation. And here you see an image of it. Uh, the mirror was just brought in March, just a few months ago, and uh, the camera was brought in uh, a few weeks ago. And here you see it. It, it was produced at uh, Stanford University, uh, roughly 1.2 meters in diameter, the size of a young person. And it has 3,200 megapixels. In other words, a thousand times more pixels than your cell phone camera. And it will survey the southern sky from Chile every four days, the entire sky. So we calculated that it could detect an Oumuamua object every couple of months. And then, of course, we could look at those objects with the web telescope that did not exist back in 2017 when Oumuamua was detected, discovered. And so we can learn much more. We can uh, detect the heat, the infrared emission from the object and infer its temperature, the surface temperature. We could triangulate, figure out the uh, precise location of the object because we can observe it from Earth and the web telescope that is a million miles away. So it's just like having two eyes allowing you a dis very accurate distance measurement. And uh, we could measure very accurately whether it exhibits any non-gravitational acceleration. And so I'm very excited about it. And with my postdocs, we developed software that will be searching for interstellar objects. And hopefully within the coming years, we know if everything that enters the solar system is rocks or there is some space trash from another civilization out there, their trash will be our treasure. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Avi. That was fantastic. I've always wanted to see you give a talk like this, and I'm glad, I'm glad this was my first one. So thanks for being you and for doing all this work and for sharing it with us. This will go up on YouTube, and so you can point people to it uh, if necessary. Anyway, uh, so I have uh, two or three questions to start the flow, and then... Uh, let, so let's just go, and then we can go to the audience, and um, Allison's going to make me a co-host or something if she has to go. First ones are the softballs. In the charts that you showed of the spherules, uh, I noticed a distinct gap in the abundance by volatility chart for silicon. Can you talk about that for a moment? Because I'd heard rumors about silicon, but it looked like silicon was simply absent. Silicon is problematic because there is plenty of it on Earth and we have to make sure that it's not the contamination. That, but indeed, uh, it would be really interesting. I should say that just a few days ago, I had a discussion with uh, an astrochemist and he worked at Los Alamos before and saying he was uh, highlighting the fact that uranium could be used as fuel and uh, beryllium is very often used uh, to moderate f uh, neutrons in a nuclear reactor. To reflect, I think, but yes. Okay, so on that uh, note, let me also ask, you also sent spherules to other labs. Have they reported back? Yeah, so there were two other uh, laboratories, uh, one at uh, UC Berkeley on the first uh, day when we came back, we passed through the UC Berkeley campus and, and then we did much more thorough work uh, in Berlin, uh, Germany, at the Brucker Corporation that has a, an X-ray fluorescence analyzer that is the best in the world. And that was helpful because we, can, we examined a large number of spherules without um, affecting them, just by X-raying them. Um, we could, uh, from the fluorescence, we could tell the composition of those spherules, uh, not as well as with a mass spectrometer, uh, only for some select elements. But uh, that helped us identify the Belau spherules. So once we realized what the fingerprint is, the Brooker Corporation experiment was really helpful. And but most of the work was done in Stein Jacobson's uh, lab. And you know, I he uh, works. And by the way, I should say uh, I looked. At, as all of you know, there was um, an Osiris uh, Rex mission to retrieve materials from the asteroid Bennu that NASA funded at eight hundred million dollars. And um, uh, the paper from the analysis came out in April this year. And I looked at the diagrams plotted there. 
And the information conveyed is very similar to the information conveyed in our paper. So basically, one can tell that the analysis done at Stein Jacobson's lab was state of the art with the best instruments in the world. But we did it for a cost that is 500 times lower than the Osiris Rex machine. Fantastic. Okay, next, next one. Um, what about non-ferrous particles? You were using rare earth magnets on the sled. Um, so that means that, you know, a lot of, it wouldn't pick up aluminum, it wouldn't pick up copper. So what is the thinking right. on that? So we obviously were aware of that. And the reason we went for magnetic particles is because we knew that the material was strong and usually that means a lot of iron. But you're right that it could have been something else. And, you know, it could have been carbon nanotubes or whatever. And then um, we had a, a second device called a sluicing device that is used uh, to filter gold. Uh, and we used it one uh, in one day. But once we started finding those ferros, we had very limited time, just two weeks, and we focused on that. So the problem with non-magnetic particles is there is a lot of background noise from everything else on the ocean floor and therefore it requires uh, much more attention uh, and maybe in the second expedition we'll be able to do a more thorough job of non-magnetic particles as you as you know i hope that on your robot for the second expedition you can include one of these non-ferrous electromagnets yes. that came on yeah. and then you selectively turn it on if you think you're in a hot spot okay because it'll find conductive materials whether or not they are ferromagnetic and it will attract them okay let's see now I'm going to give you, I'm going to save my last question for last. Does anyone from the audience uh, want to speak up or Alison, do you want to um, select a question from the chat? Do you guys want to raise hand? Perhaps that's easier to see which ones of them were already answered in the chat. Yeah, th there are 30 comments on the chat. So. Okay, we got uh, Sonny, Sonny White. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, hey, thanks, uh, Avi, for the, the talk. And when you were answering uh, Creon's question about uh, silicon abundance, I, I thought I hear, heard some buried speculation in your narrative there. We started to hint at maybe some kind of a nuclear power source, if you will. So in, in your, I would never try and pin you down on a percentage, but in, in your mind, is there a non-zero chance that there that some of the spheral, sphere, I can't say the word, sorry. Spheral. Those, those little tiny BBs. Those little tiny BBs may indeed be part of a, you know, Voyager thing. That was the original motivation for the expedition. The problem is we didn't find big enough pieces of the object. And just imagine taking my laptop and throwing it in the fireplace. It will melt. And then whatever is left from it would show some unusual uh, chemical composition. Uh, but you would never be able to say that it's definitely a technological object. But if you see, on the other hand, you see a broken piece of the screen, you would definitely be able to say that. So that is our goal. And indeed, the, the ambiguity stays. I should say, just as an anecdote, that uh, when I decided to go on this expedition, because I wanted to check if it's a Voyager-like meteor, there was a huge amount of interest from the public, from the media. When I wrote the paper that says it could have been a rock from a spaghettified planet like the Earth passing close to a dwarf star, we had actually a press release on this paper and no report whatsoever. So the New York Times at the time was interested in claiming that the meteor is a truck. And you would ask yourself, why would they report about that rather than about the possibility that we found interstellar material? And by the way, it's the first time that humans put their hands on materials from a large object that definitely came from outside the solar system because that's what the U.S. government sensors detected. And so uh -huh. I would explain it in two ways. One is lack of curiosity. The second is jealousy from academic peers. But, you know, you have a whole community of theoretical physicists working for 50 years on extra dimensions, string theory, highly speculative ideas that will not be tested in our lifetime. And when someone goes and brings materials that can be analyzed, the immediate response to that is bring it down, kill it. Whereas nobody criticizes speculations done in, in the, over 50 years 
uh, in theoretical physics. And, you know, I came to this uh, research just to explain. I, I worked in cosmology for many years, and we don't know what most of the matter in the universe is. We call it dark matter. It's invisible. And if it were to come out of the exhaust of a spaceship, we would never see it. So if someone knows what it is and uses it for propulsion, we would never see it. But at any event, in the context of the search for dark matter, it you know I did it. I worked on it for decades, and it's very much appreciated if you come up with a concept that can be tested experimentally, and then you are getting rewarded for coming up with good ideas. Whereas in this case, just claiming that it's not a stone or a rock is heresy. And if you think about uh, meteors, before 1803, it was thought that rocks cannot fall from the sky. There was this meteor shower in Liège, France. And after that, it was accepted by scientists. So now those scientists who regard themselves as the adults in the room, they would say anything that falls from the sky must be stones from the solar system. They would say the US government measured the velocity wrong, just in order to insist that it's not interstellar because they were not part of the discovery. Oh. Hey, by the way, if the New York Times said it was a truck, did they explain how the truck exploded up in the atmosphere and ended up on the ocean floor in little pieces? No, they, they just ignored, ignored the data. Now, you ask yourself, okay, why are we talking about a meteor in the first place? If it was a truck, then nobody would talk about it, right? So those scientists who said the meteor could have been somewhere else. They believe the detection of the meteor by the US government, but they don't want to accept the velocity measurement. So they just are very selective at what they accept so that they make it something that you can discuss, but not significant. As long as they bring it down to be insignificant, not anomalous. And then you ask yourself, how many other anomalies exist in science where they just shove it under the carpet and they... You know, so my point is these scientists, if they lived during the days of Nicolaus Copernicus, if they were the priests of the church, they would just argue that the uncertainties in the measurements of um, the, the motion of the planets are probably larger than reported and the earth is still at the center of the world. They would behave exactly this way. And when I think about Nicolaus Copernicus, how, he was a priest and how much integrity do you need? in order to say, I don't want to fudge the data. The data is whatever it is, but it gives me a message different than what I hear from the church. You know, that kind of a backbone is really admirable uh, in the days of Copernicus. And today it should be considered standard practice, but even yeah, today it's, it's admirable. Why should my work be considered, you know, a, as a deviation from the beaten path? This should be the beaten path. Scientists should look at anomalies and try to figure out what they mean by collecting more evidence. Fair enough. Okay, look, I don't see any other raised hands. So unless someone, oh, okay, yeah, Jared. Yeah, penal log raised hands. <laughs> oh, okay, Jared and then Emin. So a couple of points, great work, by the way, and congratulations on your bravery, because to do what you're doing requires amazing amounts of chutzpah, and you know what that is. And so congratulations to you. It's going against the beaten path. On an aside, I would like that you reach out to me on some future time. I have some information for you regarding your dark matter search that you just might be the kind of person which will glom onto what I have to say. And then final practical advice. When you are going on your next mission, I think you should invest in a sonar sled so you can get a very detailed map yeah. of the floor, we, we, even we, if you have larger objects. Yeah, we are planning to do that. Yeah. And okay, that was Thank basically you. it. And, and I would love to speak with you more offline about some stuff sure. that probably bore everybody else, but yeah. you may find very interesting. Okay. okay. Uh, you, you can find my email online. So. Okay. Uh, Avi, we've actually talked before. Uh, I was trying to get you to the Space Settlement Summit and Harvard wouldn't let you uh, travel, if you remember that. Oh, yeah. So anyway, my question is based on where you found the spherules, and uh, what data you have on the track. Uh, do you have any idea where those larger chunks might have fallen? They're gonna have different ballistics. Yes. So. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, so depending on the mass, uh, the more massive fragments uh, continue along the path of the meteor, the low mass fragments fall straight down because of the friction on air. They get slowed down faster. 
And in fact, there was uh, another meteor over Germany in February, and uh, that was over land, and people were able to find uh, uh, large pieces up to a few centimeters. That was a meteor roughly the same size as uh, the, the interstellar meteor, and but it was on land. And I was actually surprised that they went, uh, it was farmland, and the farmers didn't shot the scientists. They could go there and collect whatever they want. If it happened in the U.S., I'm not sure they would be able to enter pro private property <laughs> and collect the pieces of the meteor. But another meteor that was uh, spotted recently was last month over Spain and Portugal. It was also moving at 40, uh, about 40 kilometers per second, uh, very similar in speed to the interstellar meteor. So I was asked, is this interstellar as well? The rub is that the interstellar meteor came from behind the motion of the Earth around the sun. So its velocity relative to Earth was only 40 kilometers per sec 45 kilometers per second, but then um, relative to the sun, it was moving much faster. If it were to collide with Earth head on, it would have collided at 90 kilometers per second. And then the meteor over Spain was actually colliding head on with the motion of Earth around the sun. And that's why it was 40 kilometers per second for that one. So that one was definitely from the solar system, from the inner asteroid belt. You can trace it back to the orbit of Jupiter. And it was moving at the same speed as the interstellar meteor. It's roughly the same size, but it exploded at a, a, an altitude of 70 kilometers compared to the interstellar meteor that was at 20 kilometers above the ocean. And the air density at 20 kilometers is a thousand times bigger than the air density at 70 kilometers. So that means that the stress that the interstellar meteor was able to sustain before exploding was a thousand times bigger than this uh, Spanish uh, Portuguese uh, meteor. Uh, and that shows you how unusual this interstellar material was relative to common solar system rocks. Okay, Avi, so we're over our usual length okay. here. I'm gonna ask one last question. You may choose to answer it or perhaps not, because this one is a little bit, but uh, anyway, if you don't want to answer. Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to combine two into one here. So there have been a lot of surveys with SETI and with telescopes looking for Dyson spheres and with SETI looking for techno signatures of various sorts, and they've all come up empty, okay, in terms of techno signatures. You, though, seem to have this um, bias that we're not alone. Now, what I want to know is, is that bias based on some additional science? Is that bias just based on your priors and statistical reasoning about the abundance of planets and abundance of life? Or, and or, have you had a UAP type experience personally that has set you on this path? I didn't have a personal experience. Uh, the, the reason I'm saying that, uh, I, I believe that we are probably not alone is, you know, simply following the news. Um, it's clear that uh, we do not re represent uh, the best uh, intelligence possible. There is room for improvement. And uh, I hope that we can rely on better role models than our politicians. And, uh, you know, it's just that I think it's arrogant to believe that Albert Einstein was the smartest scientist who ever lived since the Big Bang. I think out of modesty, we should first do the search and only then have an opinion. And we haven't really done it in the way that I described, in looking for objects near Earth. Scientifically speaking, you know, I think we should hedge our bets because looking for microbes uh, might not be conclusive. If we find oxygen and methane in the atmospheres of exoplanets, uh, it would not imply that life exists there, microbial life, because you could make the same molecules by geological or chemical processes that are natural without life. However, if we find industrial pollution in the atmosphere, if we find city lights on the night side of a planet, if we find a gadget in the Pacific Ocean that has buttons on it, the question would be, should we press a button? But it would be clear that it's, it came from a technological life form, and that means that not only there is life, but there is intelligence out there that we can learn from. You know, I think that in life it's important to be an optimist because sometimes life is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay. With that, I want to thank you for your time and your work and uh, being who you are and your generosity in 
for attending this meeting and presenting for us. I invite you back to any further ones. We have a lot of interesting ones, but take care, my friend. Thank and, you for uh, inviting me. It was the I'll real see pleasure. you soon. I'll see you soon in virtual reality and real reality. Thank you.